Okay, so today we are going to look at the first miracle in John. Okay, so in John, we do not have the word miracles. In the synoptic gospels, the miracles are called mighty works, you know, because the mighty works, they stress the miraculous aspect. Whereas uh, in John, they are different. See, in the synoptics, uh, they stress the liberation from evil powers, liberation from sin, sickness, suffering and death. No, they mark the coming of the kingdom of God, the dawn of salvation. This is what we see in the synoptic gospels. That is Matthew, Mark and Luke. Whereas in John, this marvelous aspect is not stressed. What is stressed is the symbolical aspect. That is why they are called signs. You know, they are salvific wonders of God. They are signs of God's presence and salvific power in Jesus. Okay. So they have a symbolical meaning. So they are images of the spiritual life Jesus brings to people. So that is what is stressed. And usually they are connected with the discourse of Jesus. The discourse explains the particular significance of each sign. Okay. So today we are going to look at the first sign that Jesus performed and it happens in the context of a wedding. Okay, so if we read now from John chapter 2 verse 1 onwards. On the third day, there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the marriage with his disciples. So here when you read John, you must note that every word has a meaning. You know, when John says on the third day, what does it mean? When you think of third day, it is a pointer to the resurrection of Jesus. So whenever you say third day, you are reminded of the resurrection of Jesus. And John is already mentioning here that this sign that Jesus is doing will be a pointer to the resurrection. Okay, and now there is one more in interesting thing that we see here. Now this third day, okay, keep this in mind. I'm going back to the beginning of the Gospel of John. Remember I told you that the beginning, the prologue is modeled or patterned on the book of Genesis chapter 1. So in Genesis chapter 1, we see creation and God created the world in six days and on the seventh day, the day of completion, that is the day of rest, day of fulfillment. So here also John is following that pattern and so that is why we see as we read when we come to verse 29 in the first chapter after the initial introduction of John and uh, the questioning of John by the Pharisees we have here in verse 29 the next day what is this next day it is day two so what we read till verse 28 is considered as day one and verse 29 is the second day, the day two. Then as you go along, verse 35, we come to the next day, which is day three. And then again in verse 43, the next day becomes day four. Now we have four days of Jesus. And now we have on the third day. So what is four plus three? Seven. Now we have the seventh day which is the Sabbath, which is the day of rest, the day of fulfillment. And what happens on the seventh day? There is a marriage. Okay, so one basic thing we need to understand is what is the meaning of this marriage in the Bible? We have to first understand the background, the relationship God had with Israel. If you read Isaiah chapter 54 verse 5, God made a covenant with the people of Israel and he tells them, I am your husband and you are my spouse, you are my wife. That is how God addresses the people of Israel. If you read the book of Hosea, he says in verse chap chapter 2 verse 19, he says, I will betroth you to me forever. God wants to get married to his people. He makes a covenant relationship with his people. 
I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. See, so God is the husband and Israel is the bride. That is why very often we see Israel going away from her husband God, going after other gods, and uh, the prophets they say Israel has. prostituted herself she has committed adultery you see because she has gone after other husbands other gods so that was the relationship god had with his people and now in the new testament jesus is the bridegroom in the old testament it was god god the father and the new testament it is jesus that is why we read you no know, in mark's gospel Uh, when the disciples of john come and argue with the uh, disciples of jesus they say how can you know you guys uh, stay away refrain from fasting while the disciples of john are fasting our own disciples the disciples of the pharisees are fasting and jesus tells them how can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them who is the bridegroom jesus is the bridegroom the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away when jesus is taken away from them and then they will fast so jesus becomes a new bridegroom you see also you find john saying the same thing john when uh, people come to john and they say they complain you see this man jesus whom you baptized he is baptizing he is drawing a lot of people john says you know don't worry he is the one who is the bridegroom so he says He who has the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom. John the Baptist is only the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, and he rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Here Jesus is the bridegroom. John himself says that. Therefore, this joy of mine is full. He must increase, but I must decrease. So John also recognizes Jesus as the bridegroom. You see, and again Paul writing to the Corinthians, he says. i have divine, divine jealousy for you for i betrothed you to christ you became the bride of christ see and finally in the book of revelation we read about the marriage of the lamb how the lamb will get married to his bride the church and uh, finally we have these beautiful words blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb every day in the eucharist the priest says these words before we receive communion blessed are those who are invited to the supper of the lamb right to the marriage of the lamb every eucharist invites us to this wonderful futuristic event where we will be celebrating god's uh salvific uh, event on earth where we will celebrate with god in heaven that uh, eschatological meal that banquet you know so this is something that the old testament writers constantly spoke about and something that we see in the new testament as well that god is the husband god is the bridegroom uh, and or jesus is the bridegroom and we the church we the new israel are the bride and so jesus enters into uh, the human history and begins his ministry in the context of a wedding a marriage where he shows that he himself is the bridegroom and the marriage this the whole marriage is a prefiguration of uh, the eternal salvation that you and I will experience so jesus enters into uh, or uh, shows a sign that he is the bridegroom and he enters the whole picture as it were john introduces jesus through this wonderful uh, marriage through this marriage where he begins his first public sign where he shows his first public sign now let's read the passage you see when we read this passage we find that jesus with his disciples was invited and his mother was also there so you know jewish weddings normally they are a small crowd they invite people who are very close to them and so when jesus went 
and his disciples also went you know the wine must have gone used up so that is why john says when the wine failed the wine failed the mother of jesus said to him they have no wine they have no wine you see jesus his mother is probably a relative of the bride or the groom and uh, she can sense that you know they are running out of wine and wine in a wedding is the most important thing and it's very very shameful if the family is not able to provide wine to the guests and so mary is very uh, upset because she is very sensitive to the whole thing and she knows that you know it's going to be an embarrassment to the family so she runs to jesus and says they have no wine and jesus said to her woman what have you to do with me my hour has not yet come now you must understand that jesus is not reproaching his mother okay so jesus is not uh, angry with his mother he is not objecting to anything he is not refusing it's a jewish rabbinical way of answering you see when mary tells him they have no wine she is not making any request she is just informing jesus they have no wine in other words my son you have to take care of this situation okay so that's what mary is saying you know it's a very embarrassing thing for the family so better do something about it and what does jesus say he answers with a question okay it doesn't mean that jesus doesn't want to say yes to his mother but he answers it with a question what have you to do with me my hour has not yet come now oh, this hour of jesus hour of jesus what does it mean the hour of jesus always refers to the hour of his death and resurrection you see many times i've just enumerated a few here in the gospel of john about the hour so if you see john chapter 7 verse 30 he says no one laid hands on him because his hour had not yet come john keeps talking about this hour several times again in 820 he says no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come and then finally his hour comes in john chapter 12 the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified and again at the passover jesus will say you know before the feast he will say jesus knew his hour had come to depart out of the world so he's going to get his disciples together for the final act and finally in john chapter 17 verse one is his father the hour has come glorify thy son you see so the hour of jesus is that final hour when he will be crucified and he will also rise again for john uh, the death resurrection and exaltation of jesus is one event you see jesus rose exalted so the whole thing is one event in john it is not separate events it is one event and that is why Jesus on the day of the resurrection he gives the holy spirit to his disciples although we read no that there is this ascension and then there is pentecost is only then that the holy spirit comes but in john we see that on the day of the resurrection because jesus rose exalted he gives the holy spirit to his disciples and he also commissions them and he says whoever sins you forgive they are forgiven whoever sins you retain they are retained so the hour of jesus is something very very important in john and so jesus is telling mary my hour has not yet come and yet jesus will do this miracle why as a pointer to the resurrection as a pointer to that hour and so mary understands that her son will not refuse her and so what does she do his mother said to the servants do whatever he tells you beautiful words of mary you know do whatever he tells you now six stone jars were standing there for the jewish rites of purification each holding 20 or 30 gallons now when we convert it into liters each stone jar carries about 100 liters of water 100 liters six jars will mean 600 liters of water so just imagine for a jewish wedding how many bottles of wine will you need probably 
another five or six liters would have been sufficient, right? Because you're going to just pour a little from each bottle and give people. So maybe maximum 10 bottles. That means 10 liters. And here we have 600 liters of water, 600. Just see the quantity. And what did the servants do? They fill them up to the brim. So 600 liters of water. Okay. So what happens? He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the steward of the feast. So they took it. When the steward of the feast tasted the water, now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first. And when men have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. You see, so, so something so extraordinary. The servants just fill up water according to the instructions of Mary. And if you look at these jars, they are meant for Jewish purification. Now this purification is an external ritual, right? It's an external ritual which doesn't do anything to you internally. Whereas we find that Jesus uh, through his coming, through his offering of himself, uh, he will bring about uh, complete transformation and renewal in people, right? So what was once uh, an empty, what was once a meaningless ritual with the coming of Jesus, with the giving of himself to us will become something very significant, very important, very beautiful by Jesus offering himself to us. Now, therefore, this whole thing becomes a pointer and the key word here is wine and what wine? It's not ordinary wine. It's special wine, good wine. That's what the steward says. They have kept the good wine, the best wine you have kept until now. So, what is the uh, understanding that we have? You see, first of all, Jesus is doing this miracle as a pointer to what he will do finally at his resurrection. So, this whole thing. The public life of Jesus opens with a Jewish wedding feast and Jesus makes the wine flow in abundance because the word wine, what does it mean? So we look at it here. We know in the book of Genesis, uh, Jacob, uh, you know, blesses each of his sons and then he blesses his son Judah. And there he speaks about the messianic wine or the symbol of messianic joy. And so Judah, <coughs> so he says, Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies and your father's son shall bow down before you. So Judah is like the leader among his brothers. And you see the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Okay. And going further to the Verse 11 it says, binding his foal to the wine and his ass cold to the choice wine, he washes his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. So what is the meaning of this eyes red with wine? It means that he is full of joy. That's the messianic joy. So the Messiah, when he comes, his eyes will be red with wine means he will be so wine is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus will be full of the Holy Spirit and he will have this messianic joy which he will give to his people. And that is why Jesus makes the wine flow in abundance to show this messianic joy because for the Jews, wine was a symbol of joy. And for us, the wine is a symbol of the Holy Spirit a symbol of joy, a symbol of messianic salvation and his teeth white with milk shows the purity of the Messiah. And again, Amos talking about this, he says there will be the abundance of the messianic gifts when the Messiah comes. That is why he says the mountains shall drip sweet wine 
and all the hills shall flow with it. See, and I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel. They shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall make their gardens and eat their fruit. So here we have uh, the abundance of gifts that come from the Messiah. We have the abundance of wine that flows. And Jesus, through this wonderful miracle, through this sign, he shows that he is the Messiah. He is the one sent by the Father. So Jesus enters his public life in the Gospel of John through this wedding. So in the middle of the wedding feast, through this wonderful symbol of messianic salvation that he brings, Jesus shows us that he is the son sent by the father. Okay. So just imagine, I don't know what they would have done with all this wine that came. You know, probably they would have not even used one jar of wine because one jar itself was 600 liters. And so, I mean, 100 liters. So if six jars were there, the other five jars, 500 liters, I don't know, they would have drunk and drunk and drunk for so many days. And uh, so this whole thing, why John is writing is to show the abundance that Jesus, that Jesus brings when he comes. Okay. So, what is John trying to tell us here? In verse 11, he says, This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So, this sign that Jesus did, he did in order to manifest his glory, to show himself to the world. And John wants to show that this Cana miracle is a sign of his resurrection, is a pointer to the resurrection. Because water for Jewish rites of purification is changed into wine. And wine at the Last Supper, that is at the hour of Jesus, will turn into his blood. And this is the universal purification fulfilled by Jesus at his hour, that is at the Passover. You see, the old covenant becomes new covenant in the blood of Jesus. And Israel, who are the people of God, now become the family, the new family, the children of God. That is the significance that is behind this wonderful, beautiful story that John is bringing out to us. You see, so when we say that uh, Jesus manifested his glory, he is manifesting the salvific power of God, both in the Old Testament and Jesus will follow Jesus, will, will follow him to the cross and there after his resurrection, they will fully understand that he will be the Messiah, that he will be the promised one sent by the Father. And they will have complete trust in him. Okay, so this is what John is saying. Another thing that we read in John is about the word woman. The word woman. Why does Jesus address Mary as woman? See, so woman is the name of the official function of Mary from Genesis to Revelation. So if you read uh, the book of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, we have what is called the Proto-Evangelium or the first gospel where after the sin of Adam and Eve, after the devil has uh, kind of uh, cheated Adam and Eve, no? so after that uh, initial encounter, uh, God intervenes and he says to the enemy, he says to, to the devil, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So here she is addressed as woman. Eve is addressed as woman. And this is the title that is given to Mary. That is why Jesus uh, on the cross before he dies, he addresses his mother as 
woman, woman behold your son. And finally in the book of Revelation when we read in chapter 12, we read about the woman clothed with the sun. I want you to read this uh, chapter from verses 1 to 6 where this woman is pregnant and she's going to give birth to a son and that will be a son who is going to be attacked by the enemy and she will have to run and protect the child for a long period of time. It's a very interesting passage uh, which was read at mass at several occasions. So this uh, picture of Mary as the woman clothed with the sun, you see, and uh, also being pregnant and carrying a son and she will soon deliver the son. So all this symbolizes the role, the official function of Mary in the Bible. And that is why Jesus, John puts into the mouth of Jesus this word woman, because she will be the one who will uh, be the first disciple. She will be the one who will, you know, bring Jesus to the world and uh, she will at the cross receive this uh, uh, great uh, task from Jesus. She will be entrusted with the protection of a son who will, you know, uh, have his uh, people constantly fighting with the enemy. So you and I will have a constant struggle with evil powers and Mary will be the one who will be our intercessor, who will be our protector. And so Jesus gives Mary to us because she must protect us, the church, from the attack of the evil one. So she is the first member and the mother and the symbol of the church after the hour of Jesus, after the hour of Jesus. See? So, so summing up all this, you know, when Jesus says, how does it concern me? How does it concern you and me? How does it concern us? You know? So it's about the hour that Jesus is talking. It is not yet the hour of salvation, but he says, when my hour comes, the wine, that is the blood of salvation will flow. So this wine miracle that we now saw in this small wedding is a pointer to that blood that will flow on the cross. Now, if you look at John, John is writing this gospel after so many years. Now, John has seen the wine flow in abundance at the wedding of Cana. John has also seen the wine transformed into the blood of Jesus at the Last Supper. And John has finally seen the blood of Jesus flow at the hour, at the hour of his death and hour of his death and resurrection, no, at the hour of his uh, crucifixion and death on the cross. So John understands that this blood that flows from the cross of Jesus is the blood of the new covenant, is the blood of the messianic salvation. Therefore, John sees in Cana the sign of the hour of Jesus, of the great messianic eschatological salvation. You see, John understands the significance now under the illumination of the Holy Spirit after Pentecost. You see, John also was like the other disciples. They did not understand anything that Jesus did when he walked this earth. And that is why none of the other gospel writers ever talk about this wedding at Cana. It's a very insignificant thing. But you see how a simple Jewish village wedding feast is transformed into such a powerful symbol by John because of the illumination of the Holy Spirit. John sees in this simple event a wonderful prefiguration to what Jesus will do finally on the cross, how he will give his blood, which will be poured out for humankind and how it will become a symbol of salvation. Similarly, this miracle that Jesus does, does you know, where there is the abundance of wine, becomes a sign, a prefiguration for the great event of Jesus. And so John wants to show that Jesus is the son sent by the father. He is the Messiah. So 
John is not doing this or Jesus is not doing this miracle to please his mother. No, Jesus does this sign to show what he is and in order to manifest his glory. And by this sign, the people understand, his disciples will understand that Jesus is the Messiah and they believe in him. See, that is how beautifully the passage ends. You see, it ends by saying in verse 11, it says, Jesus manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So you and I today, my dear friends, are called to believe in the sign of Jesus, that Jesus is the son sent by the father. And that is what John wants to show in every passage. And so John doesn't say anything here. Usually after a miracle, there's a big discourse. But here the miracle itself becomes a beautiful pointer to who Jesus is. And so John only says one line, in fact, just one verse where he says, Jesus did this first sign of his in order to manifest his glory. And by manifesting his glory, his disciples believe in him. And when you, the reader, are reading this, I want you to believe that Jesus is the son sent by the father, that he is the Messiah and that he will make the wine flow in your life. When you are running out of wine, when your life is running dry, when everything seems to be coming to an end. You see, at that wedding, if the wine had run out, you know, it would have been such an embarrassment for the family. And in our lives too, when we are almost running out of wine, when our wells are running dry, we turn to the Savior. We turn to Jesus and he is going to give us his salvation, his wine of joy. And he is going to fill us with his divine life. And then we will begin to experience something new and beautiful. And like the steward, you and I can say, you know, God has kept the best wine until now. You know, uh, in the context of a wedding, people say, you know, for a couple who are married, you know, their initial life, the first few weeks and months are the honeymoon period where they are so happy and so joyful. And then when life begins, you know, there are so many twists and turns, ups and downs, problems, misunderstandings, and sometimes, you know, leading to a divorce. All this becomes such a terrible thing in the life of a couple. But then when Jesus is there in the couple's life, when Jesus is there in the family, when you invite him into your family, like Jesus was invited for the marriage feast at Cana, there will only be abundance. There will not be emptiness. There will not be barrenness. There will not be, you know, sadness. There will be this messianic joy. You know, Jesus, every time he is invited, he does something beautiful. And so when we invite him into our homes, into our families, into our lives, the joy will flow. The wine will flow in abundance. And we will realize very soon that the best is yet to come. Probably we've seen happy days. Probably we've seen, uh, you know, a lot of joyful moments in our lives. But then, as the steward says, we will still keep saying, the best is yet to come, you know, because uh, that is what down the ages the saints have experienced and many others have experienced when they invited God into their lives, their life, which was in a mess, which they thought was you know, coming to an end or breaking up, gets transformed to the coming of Jesus. When we really invite him into our lives, when Jesus becomes the center of our lives, remember, he will only bring his joy. He will only bring his abundance. And there will always be joy in our lives. You know, we cannot understand. You know, there are times when we run to others for help, when we run to people in power for help. But then we realize that they are helpless. We run to doctors, we run to lawyers, we run to politicians. 
we run to people in power when we need something but today jesus is saying do you run to me he says come to me all you are burdened and heavy laden i will give you rest and today as we look at jesus who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith we are reminded that we need to run to him first not to anyone else because he is the only one who knows our need who understands our need and who is waiting to fulfill our need so today as we read this beautiful passage let us remind ourselves that we need to turn to jesus let us turn to jesus let us turn to him in our moments of trials let us turn to him every day and say lord come into our lives lord stay with us lord dine with us lord be with us lord be part and parcel of every event that happens in our life when we do that jesus blesses our lives blesses it in a very beautiful way so that we begin to understand his plan in our lives we begin to understand how beautiful life is otherwise life without jesus is barren you see the jews had these gallons and gallons of water for purification but this external purification never did anything to them but only when jesus poured his blood on the cross you see that was when you and i became sons and daughters of god and you and i began to experience his presence and power in our lives and so today when we invite jesus to stay with us he begins to do something new he begins to open our eyes to recognize the whole plan of god's salvation to recognize the whole purpose of our life here on earth and through his presence within us we will be able to give meaning to all the sufferings that we go through give meaning to all that you and i encounter every day and so today as we conclude the session let's ask the lord to come into our lives let's ask him to stay with us and let's invite him as the lord not just as a guest but as a lord that he may stay with us that he may constantly lead us and guide us that our lives may become joyful